welcome, welcome to episode 53 of an Airful podcast with me, Matt Lunt. And me, Matty Ashton. And on this episode, we speak to Mercedes and Phoenix of dreamy, grungy pop band, Soft Cult. So we talk about, on this episode, the latest EP, Year of the Rat, talk about the recording process and also the fact that they self-produced this uh, record as well as doing the music videos. We talk all about that. We talk musical influences behind uh, behind the music. So there's a, there's a couple in there that I really enjoy talking about, uh, but you'll see that later. And we get onto a fat section of horror, like a fucking huge chunk of horror and you'll love it. We get into like... <laughs> All these different horror movies. We end up talking about Halloween, and then we get onto like scare mazes. So yeah, you you definitely don't want to miss that. And after you've listened to it, stop it even halfway through. Actually, no, fuck it. Listen to us first, but then go and check out Year of the Rat, the brand new EP, because it is banging. Make sure to go check that out on all digital platforms. You know where to go. Otherwise than that, enjoy the episode. Enjoy. I've got a fly right next to my webcam. Hang on. Let me oh, no. Off. There it goes. I just saw like a leg on the side of my screen. That <laughs> <laughs> was like, it's horrible. <laughs> but anyway, on the side. Uh, so we've uh, got Mercedes and Phoenix from Softcult. How are we doing today? We're doing well. Thanks for having us. We're just having our coffee. Stoked to talk about some scary movies. <laughs> It, what is it like? Is it morning where you are at the moment then, or is it afternoon? Or it's afternoon. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we had a wine night yesterday. Yeah. We got it. Okay. Okay. Basically <laughs> morning for us. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to ask. Whilst you mentioned coffee, are you into coffee, or is it just a a wake up fix? We love coffee. Yeah, a little too much sometimes because it's like too easy. We're in our home studio right now, so. Oh, cool. Whenever we're like, you know, flow's going well and then it starts to lag and you're kind of getting out of ideas or something like that, the first thing we do is like, uh, let's go make a coffee. And then <laughs> it ends up being like you have like six coffees a day or something. And yeah, we're trying to work on that. Yeah. We have kind of a coffee addiction at the moment. There is nothing wrong with that. Is like, do you have like a preference in how you have your coffee or is it just literally coffee machine, button, go? Yeah, Matt's a coffee nerd, by the way. I'm a pure coffee nerd. Coffee nerd. <laughs> we just got one of those like ninja coffee machine things, which is kind of a treat for us. So it can make, lo- like it has a frother, so we can make lattes, Ooh. make cappuccinos. And it even has like a cold brew function and stuff. So. Nice. We've been experimenting with that. Um, but I usually just go for like a cappuccino or something. And we're, but, we're both but, like vegan, so we'll have it with like oat milk, I guess, if you want to get super technical. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to like oat milk. Like I've, I've just standard like normal milk, but yeah. like I'm thinking like it will be better for the planet if I had like oat milk, but I'm just really struggling to get behind it. I, it's, you know, everyone has their struggles with that stuff. Like when I first started milk, I was never a big fan of milk. So switching to like, you know, almond milk, ketchup, yeah, yeah. whatever, like that, I actually liked it better. So that wasn't hard, but cheese was the hard one for me. Cause I love like grilled cheese, pizza, all that stuff. And I'm, I won't lie the the vegan cheese right now, it's still pretty good on like, quesadillas and nachos and stuff but it doesn't quite cut it for you know some of the other things yeah you yeah like, resign yourself you gotta like live <laughs> the- <laughs> monk and try your best <laughs> cheese is life cheese is life <laughs> so just jump into questions then so you guys grew grew up in ontario is that right yeah we did yeah we we're born and raised in kitchener ontario Sweet. So what was the scene or like the music that you listened to like growing up was like inspirations? Uh, it's cool. I guess like around here there was kind of a what would you call it? Like a hardcore scene. There's actually a genre that's like Southern Ontario hardcore that probably nowhere else in the world knows or cares about. Yeah. Well, it's, one uh, of our, one of our other guys has got a hardcore project podcast within this podcast. So he'll probably be onto that straight away. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah 
yeah. <laughs> and it, it, so there is a sound, I guess, that maybe if you're from Ontario, you, you know, or if you're like super into that whole genre. But that was kind of the scene here was either like super hardcore punk or super hardcore, just hardcore or metal or whatever. It was like a very alternative scene. Yeah. When we were teenagers, there actually weren't a ton of women in the scene on stage. So we would show up to these gigs and always be kind of like, because neither of us like can scream or, you know, do anything like that. So yeah. we like light a stand on the bill. And it was an interesting vibe. You know, people would either show up to be like, I gotta see this. Oh my God, chicks on stage and all this stuff. <laughs> or they'd be really supportive and be like, yeah, guys, go up there. You give it your best. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was and now I'm happy to say like there's a lot more diversity in our little local scene such as it is but back then yeah it was rough it was rough, <laughs> it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> so like my my knowledge on in terms of Canada bands like I'm a massive fan of Lexis on Fire and City in Color yes oh my um God. That's kind of, I feel really bad that I don't know more about like the Canada like scene in general because there is so much good music coming out of there in a the minute. You got you guys, you got Spirit Box, mm-hmm. like an overflow of so many good bands. <laughs> oh, that's all that right. I mean, Alexis on Fire, are like the crown jewel of, you know, the alternative band scene in Canada. Everyone, you know, I love them so much. Yeah, like, they're amazing. But yeah, it's true. I think like maybe that's like, a, a problem in Canada is breaking out of just the Canadian scene into like international scenes. Because I don't know, it seems that's like everyone's goal is to either break in the UK or break in the States, but just get get out of Canada. You know? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting because there's bands here that will be massive, like they'll tour arenas, but only in Canada and then outside of Canada, like if they just cross the border three hours to the states yeah yeah and no one knows who they are so it it is kind of weird how it is sort of a little bubble in canada at times and it can, it's like good and bad i guess it's good <laughs> to have like a nice community and kind of feel like you're supporting canadian music but it's also bad if you're trying to like break out and get to other places <laughs> How did you guys find it breaking out into like the the USA then, for example, like with with this band and obviously Courage, my love as well. Like, how, how did you guys find that? Warp Tour was a huge help because yeah. we did two summers on Warp Tour with Courage, my love, and um, I think that's how we got like probably the bulk of our USA fans. I would say is through yeah. through those tours, and then you know they'd come out to all our little like headliner runs and little things like that but i think warp tour for us was like a big mm-hmm. help in actually breaking out of the canadian scene and then here i guess like with soft cult in the uk we just got lucky enough to be signed by a uk record label so definitely that was like a big part of like making those connections overseas and kind of getting into like uk bands and i don't know just becoming hopefully I mean, part of that world <laughs> we've always loved the music coming out of the uk like some of my favorite bands of all time and bands that we would like try and model our sound after have come out of the uk like radiohead is like my all-time favorite band. yeah nice yes just like you know it it's like a it was kind of always a goal that we wanted to have we just felt like the stuff we were making might not be like your typical canadian sound yeah you know, that gets like that gets big here but it might do well in the uk because you guys are on some next level cheese <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's like it, it's crazy much that because obviously i was listening to like your ep and your guys music and i was getting loads of different vibes from it like for example um what's the song called now uh bird song i was getting properly like mazzy stair vibes from it but then as a listen i did get like bits of like cock two twins in there and then researching you guys like obviously before this i realized it actually covered like one of the songs which are very crazy um so are you guys big cop two fans then oh yeah, yeah. they're yeah. like it's amazing i was a little bit sad when i found out there weren't actual twins in the band <laughs> <laughs> but it was still like i still love their sound and yeah they're obviously like such a huge inspo for like guitar tones and... yeah or even vocal yeah. production just like how dreamy and i feel like they were so ahead of their time too 100 percent, yeah you know there's so many shoegaze bands that sort of are, are going for that like sound or guitar tone or whatever and yeah 
in like the 80s which is pretty insane yeah. for me it's like the vocals is like the, the old like nonsensical lyrics and the fact that you focus more on the melodies from the vocals more than the actual lyrics themselves which for me yeah. is like the first time like that's ever happened so when i yeah when i first heard that having a last vegas album like my mind was completely blown like <laughs> Oh, that album is actually so amazing. Yeah, that song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fingers crossed for a reunion anyway at some point, but it's probably never oh, going to happen. That time are re reuniting and like trying to tour as soon as touring comes back, which is pretty sick. Please, gigs. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said this on the last episode we did, but my fucking God, I miss gigs. <laughs> But it looks like where you guys are at, they're kind of slowly coming back, are they not? Yeah, so we've just had announced the uh, Download Fest pilot, where it's like a 10,000 capacity version of the festival, mm -hmm. just to see how that goes. And then they've done it, obviously, with mainly like UK bands headlining, and it's all like UK bands in the lineup. But it should be interesting to just to see where that goes, because they did a show in Liverpool, which is pretty close to where we are. Uh, where the, there was like a smaller capacity gig and I think there was, there was like a really small amount of like COVID cases came from it so it's all a plus anyway mm -hmm. yeah I know I mean we're excited to see stuff happening over in the UK and uh, just because like in in Canada we're thinking like oh, okay well stuff that how how things are being handled there and just like the time frame of things coming back we seem to be maybe like three months behind all of that here so it's kind of like looking into the right. future and seeing like what happens where you guys arrive we're like okay maybe we can expect that in like three to four months <laughs> yeah <laughs> so is it fairly strict at the moment yeah, yeah we're in lockdown right now and it's been oh since, wow <laughs> um the end of april or like that no i think it was like since the beginning of april so it's we're still the lockdown right our problem was we in ontario anyway we would keep getting lockdowns and then lifting them way too soon and as soon as like the numbers would go down they'd be like oh it's all good and then the numbers <laughs> yeah so at uh, this one it's like our third like serious lockdown and it seems like you know now it's actually kind of working and they're doing it more gradually so fingers crossed it might be the last one and it's supposedly ending on like June fourteenth, so we'll see what happens with that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> so, music, at least, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, I, think, I don't think we like in general music-wise. I don't think it could do until like say the end of the year doing the same thing where it's like open shut, open shut, because it's like so exhausting. Yeah. I do feel bad for the smaller venues and stuff like, uh, you know, it, it's always last year, I think was the worst seeing like a bunch of smaller venues get shut down and it's understandable, you know, it's hard to like, you know, keep afloat without any government funding or anything like that. But it's always sad when you see that because your, your fave venue just gets yeah. shut down. You're like, great. I'm never going to play there again. I'm never going to yeah. see a show there again. Yeah. So sad. So when did you we guys start with you? Go on, Mark. Oh my, you've got a serious leg, so I'm going to let you do your bit <laughs> first. No, I was, I was just going to say, uh, when did you guys start the writing process for Year of the Rat then? Was this during lockdown or? Yeah, it definitely yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. We started, you know, pretty much around this time last year, maybe a little earlier, because I distinctly remember, you know, we were trying to figure out what kind of sound we wanted soft cult to have and what like the ethos of this band was going to be and all that stuff and then um the george floyd murder happened and you know i feel like the world kind of stopped and like yeah all we were just seeing on our timelines all this like police brutality and stuff like that and then the music just started like flowing after that so i feel like that frustration of being like stuck at home there were some protests and stuff here, but not on the same scale as in other parts of the world. And mm. we were kind of like seeing that and feeling frustrated that we couldn't really do anything or contribute very much. So it was coming out in the lyrics for sure. Um, and then, yeah, we've pretty much had from then all the way until now to just write and record here in our home studio, film music videos, which has also been fun and challenging in COVID. <laughs> but we've been doing it with like 
a super small crew and like I edit them and stuff and just just making it work basically for a year and a bit. <laughs> That's incredible though. Like it's just the whole DIY aspect and it looks so fucking good because it has such like a nice vibe to it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much. It, it yeah. definitely it, it definitely works nicely with obviously the whole EP. So but you guys released an EP with Charisma Love last year. What yeah. when was like the moment where you kind of decided that you kind of wanted to separate as a completely separate entity rather than as like a progression on that band? Because obviously there was hints of the sort of vibe you was going for with Soft Call in the last EP, would be fair and say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think like we kind of had made because uh, we started writing, I guess, and just like thinking of making a new project a while ago. So kind of around the same time, I guess, that we put out CML's EP. And then we had a feeling it might be like it the just, last one or something. Yeah, it just seemed like really different what we were writing. And like CML definitely like flip flop genreize a lot. But then, yeah, this just seemed like it deserved to be like its own kind of thing. Because we just had like, I don't know. I think a bit clearer of a vision maybe yeah. for it. So it's bound to happen when you, you know, like uh, I'm sure you guys have, you know, been in projects at some point or whatever where it's like it started as one thing and then kind of it changes into something else. And with CML, we started that band when we were like 16. And so yeah. over 10 years, it can change so much <laughs> from what it was. Um, oh, and- I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's not always the most accurate representation of like who you are anymore um, 10 years later. So I, I don't know, the songs for Soft Cult just seemed to fit more of like who we are now, what we're interested in now, socially, politically, and musically. And so we were like, you know what? It's probably a good time to try a new project and see where that goes. <laughs> Was it quite nerve wracking in terms of that going like, oh shit, I'm about to press like the reset button and like what you've been doing and go like, right, let's just see what happens and how we should go. A little bit. Just be, yeah, when you have like a history with a band for a long time and it's been Mm -hmm. like part of your life for so long and then yeah, just like starting over. But honestly, I think we were just more excited than anything. Because we reached a point where like, it's sort of like, so if it's not like fun anymore, or if you don't feel like you're being represented in your music anymore, then it it's just kind of naturally grinds to a halt. So as much as it was a little nerve wracking, like starting something new and putting it out and all the questions and stuff like that, it did feel like a breath of fresh air because we were able to write without any you know, constraints from our old label or any expectations or anything like that. So it was kind of nice in that way. It felt like a creative rejuvenation or something. Yeah, absolutely. I think that actually relates to what me and Maya are doing in the minute with in terms of like our band project, because you have that kind of like whole detachment to you going, oh, we have all these good times and memories with like playing shows and writing bits and stuff like that. But then when it starts not sounding the way that you write if that makes sense that it's kind of like you don't feel attached to it in that sense anymore and you kind of just end up like going well this is just negging me out now (laughs) yeah yeah, that definitely can happen yeah and I feel like that's yeah when you start like the music you're making it you start like losing your voice in it that's kind of like a hard thing to understand and like get ahead of too you know especially since it is such a release I think you know Phoenix and I, you know, in our old label deal, we were signed to like a major label. And whenever you're signed to a major label and they actually have like big budgets for things, they expect like a return on that. So then just naturally they kind of um, oversee things more. And in our case, we felt like a little creatively stifled. Like we'd have these ideas. We wanted to do artsier stuff than what we were doing. And then it was just like, the kibosh on that like right from yeah. the beginning yeah it did kind of feel like we were at the at the lowest point of cml it felt like we were writing to please like our a and r guy or you know just not ourselves so yeah. i'm happy to say that that's not the case anymore now we can write mm. like, yeah. <laughs> whatever we want and mm-hmm. it's all <laughs> so was the process in terms of actually separating yourself from a label standpoint was that 
quite difficult or is it pretty much like we don't want this agreement anymore and you kind of just cut ties with it we luckily like we'd already kind of with our with cmo's last cp it was like the end of that contract anyway. yeah so we just fulfilled the contract and yeah it was kind of like a clean break it yeah. wasn't anything messy so. and, and you know you do form like personal relationships with people you've worked with for 10 years obviously mm -hmm. so yeah there's no like hard feelings on a personal standpoint it just was I think like it was clear to everyone on like a business level that it just wasn't really gelling anymore so I think you know it was kind of a best case scenario we were all able to just be like well that was fun thanks guys and just move on type thing yeah next yeah. chapter sort of thing so did you, did you guys spend a lot of time like like before writing the CP, just trying to figure out where you wanted to head with your sound and like trying to like fine tune it down to what it is now. Yeah, at first there were like, it's weird because I thought it would be so much harder to nail down a sound and I was kind of, you know, in my head about it. But then when we actually started writing, I think maybe that experience we were talking about with feeling stifled in some ways was a good thing for this project because we just like naturally did all the things that we wanted to do but couldn't do before so like we wanted to have like more scuzzy kind of fuzzy grungy guitar tones and yeah. stuff and wanted to write more angry lyrics or more like you know social commentary lyrics and stuff like that and we didn't feel comfortable doing that so i think it was kind of like the dogs just like let off the leash and they just like ran with it you know yeah it's cool because so, there's, there's, there's a lot of bands like obviously like that progress with their albums like going back to that that thing and they get like slated for it because they've sort of changed the sound a bit but as you were saying like they've matured more like they're not like what they they don't write like they used to when they was like younger and mm -hmm. like it's, it's bullshit sometimes like, because sometimes you get fans that expect a certain thing from them. But like you said, it, creatively, the artists want to go a different way. And I remember like specifically, um, I remember Hayley Williams like completely like writing off a misery business because again, she said she wrote that when she was like 16 and like she didn't actually connect to it anymore. And she didn't, didn't she like remove it from the live set so she doesn't play it live yeah. like, much anymore, which fair enough to her. But I know a lot of people like, wasn't weren't happy about that but it's understandable that like you want to just like distance yourself from that and just like play stuff that you enjoy playing and that like means a lot more to yourself i mean yeah. the thing with that as well is that it, if the people want to listen to misery business it's just go and find it on spotify or apple yeah. music because if it's the way i the way i think of albums is that each album's like an era of someone it's like a chapter so it's it's into where you are at that current point so when pe people are like oh you don't send the same as your full your first album it doesn't make first album. that's For so sure. true yeah that's very true i think yeah that happens like with any band the you know the first thing they do will get kind of i don't know the initial hype yeah or it'll be nostalgic to people because that's the first time they heard that band and then when they do something else it's like oh dang but i liked you in this way that i first heard of you i guess you know it's hard yeah. to accept that <laughs> band's change we're kind of going through it right now not in the sense because obviously like we've just started in january and our ep just came out like a month and a half ago but we're already these songs for the second EP, the follow up, and it now I how much <laughs> and then whenever you have to follow something up, there is always that like that's good enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's the thing as well with people's like first album you don't know how long they've, been, they've spent writing that first album. So like 1975 was like 10 years, wasn't it, Matty, where they spent 10 years on this first album and then yeah. everyone expected the same quality of stuff from yeah. 10 years of work in a year's time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, crazy. Oh. Yeah, like, that's the thing. I didn't know that. That's crazy. That's wild, yeah, 10 yeah. years. That's like, yeah, that would be so much pressure too. It's like, all right, well, this touring cycle is over. Time for like a new album. Mm, what you got? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
that's why like we've really been focusing on writing so much and recording and stuff during this time because we know that or we hope that we will be relatively busy with touring when that's possible again so mm. we we don't want to stop the release like flow we kind of want to keep things as steady as possible and just keep releasing music and not sit on anything yeah but in order to do that you have to have like finished songs ready to go there's a lot of planning and stuff that like you know we're pretty impatient but yeah a lot of planning that takes time and stuff so <laughs> just using this time to write and record and i think we have enough material for maybe like two more eps if we really want nice. <laughs> the first time in our yeah in, ever ever that we've, had, we've been that ahead that we've been like, ahead yeah <laughs> you self-produce summer right yeah so, so where do you go with inception of music then is it like one person starts um I'm like as you get together every time where stage will kind of come up with an idea and then show it to me at, when it's like I don't know kind of formed already and then we just like finish it up together or vice versa like mm -hmm. I'll start something and then show Sades but yeah for the most part we, we write everything together and we definitely record and produce everything together it seems like, I don't know if this is just because it's like convenient in the home studio, but we'll start with like the instrumental and the vibe of that first generally, and then write like the metal, the melody, the lyrics, everything like that on top of that. So usually it's kind of like, it all kind of comes together in the studio. Inst yeah. Like in the past, we would like be like sitting with an acoustic guitar, writing a full song, but just like, Lately, because we have this studio and we have all these little toys that we want to play with and stuff, it seems like yeah it comes together as we record it, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. I think that's the best thing about having a home studio, isn't it? Because there's been loads of times where I've like got my guitar, and then I'll, mm -hmm. I'll write something, go, I'll work on that, and then by the time like a plug in and whatever else, it's like shit, I forgot it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think just having a plug in, just record it. What it, if it sounds like shit? doesn't matter at least you've like got it yeah yeah that's very true it's good to like have the that ability to just plug in and like record ideas as they come and then mm -hmm. yeah you yeah. can always edit them after or whatever you need to do but yeah and it's, it's helpful also that phoenix and i i mean are both like we have been doing it all ourselves up until this point but we both have a lot to learn and we both you know it's not like either of us went to school for production or anything like that. So a lot of it is trial and error. And as difficult as it can be sometimes or challenging, it also is cool because we we hear something and come up with a way of, you know, achieving that sound or achieving that visual. That might not be the most like correct way of doing it, but I but someone who like really knows what they're doing may not have even thought to do it that way type thing so yeah sometimes the inexperience can be good yeah. i guess it makes it leads to happy accidents happy well. accidents yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i think that's quite fulfilling though having it at that aspect like for example in a minute like i try and get into like doing more photography like um i have absolutely fuck off fly uh, <laughs> so, but I, like i have like no like degree courses or anything in photography so i've been like right youtube and, <laughs> and sit yeah. and see where we go from there and it, i think that way of doing stuff it feels more like fulfilling because it's like so independent that you're not having to rely on other people to show you how to do it yeah mm -hmm. that's very true it's that true. Is actually so true y youtube is like i hate to say it but it really is like such a great tool when, when yeah, I'm editing, <laughs> yeah i mean you know but it, it's great like when i'm editing or or doing anything you know with the, the video stuff if i don't know there's definitely a tutorial that we can find mm -hmm. uh so it's like it's been helpful that way and it's cool because i do think when you're learning um if if someone like shows you how they do it they're showing you what works for them but when yeah. you're forced to find your own way then you find a lot faster what works for you. So 
I don't know, being independent that way and, and being a little more DIY, it, it has its benefits for sure. I think there's a lot of freedom in that for sure. I know a lot of artists, obviously, when they're in the studio, they like do like a bit of a back and forth, don't they, with a the producer where you can sort of like pick up on like little ideas or you might have like little bits that you might think will work good with it. So do you find like you just got to like, you, you go to like your friends for like references. So like you'll, you do something and you just like, guys, like how, how does this sound? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, we do do that. Like that's, I guess, one part of producing yourself that you, at least like, I feel like I need like an outside ear a lot. Yeah. We'll, yeah we'll do we'll do the demo test a lot we'll mm. just like bounce a demo and then listen to it like literally like a hundred times in the car or like whatever while we're doing dishes while we're doing or... dishes and then <laughs> that sometimes <laughs> that'll lead to like new ideas or like oh that part would sound sick if you know like it had i don't know a crazy reverb on it or yeah and then yeah obviously we'll show it to friends but our friends are just so amazing they're usually just gassing us up the whole time so yeah yeah <laughs> we can't trust <laughs> them. <laughs> objectivity yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're too nice so funnily enough you mentioned obviously about like you gaining traction in the uk so like my first acknowledgement of you guys was through daniel p Carter's rock show mm. where i had all my because i have this religious thing of like every monday when i'm at work when i'm doing like whatever I'm doing, I'll just shove headphones on, put it on and listen through. And if there's any new bands, I'll pick them up on that. And then her take it off. And then I was like, holy shit, what the fuck was that? Went back and then I tried to find like the name for it. It was only after the two songs. It was like, oh, this is softcore. I was like, sick, I'm getting on that. But how how did that come to be? Did, they, did Daniel Picard get in contact with you? Or is it just kind of like you were played? And you were like, oh shit. He honestly was just championing us really hard um because i because we had a song that we take down and it because like there were fans of this band this other band uh that were like saying oh it sounds exactly like this song it sounds like that song so then i think there was like some discourse online that he somehow became aware of and then through i think he felt bad for us if i'm being completely honest like i think he <laughs> He took pity on us and went, and he was like, oh, you know what, I'm going to, because originally he wanted to play that song, which we now refer to as the cursed song. Um, right. <laughs> but it, it led to a lot of really good things because because he ended up playing us on his show and kind of becoming a fan that way. And he's just been um, advocating for us and championing us a, a lot sooner than we thought. Like it's been our dream to end up on the BBC with our music somehow. Um, and we did not think it was going to happen with this first EP at all. So, you know, again, a happy accident, I guess you could say. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw you guys do one regardless. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have got your own like online magazine as well called Scripture. Um, where did that idea come from? And for those who haven't like read it, what sort of like contents can they like, sort of expect from it when they're reading it oh yeah it's cool um definitely uh the idea kind of came from uh those 90s fanzines uh of the riot girl movement that was like a big part of what inspired us for sure and i guess this is just like our version of that um yeah and as far as what's inside the zine it the topics change all the time but for the most part it is pretty um i guess you could call it forth with feminism lots of societal issues um the latest one we just put out yesterday focuses on like harmful gender norms and gender stereotypes and stuff like that and what you can do to kind of challenge that but yeah. I, every issue has its own i guess topic that it talks yeah. about um <laughs> but it, it is very focused on like empowerment and stuff like that and and i think my favorite part of that aside from getting to see phoenix do all these dope collages <laughs> and stuff <laughs> is, um, there's been uh fans that will submit their own art or poetry oh wow to so we feature like a page of of submissions as well and uh that's another reason why we're just looking forward to shows again so we can like have these physical zines yeah and just 
hand yeah. them out at shows and kind of build a community that way that is like Phoenix said like really similar to the Riot Grrrl movement in the 90s and just bringing like you know fourth wave feminism to the yeah. punk scene or to the alternative scene <laughs> yeah I think it's a way of like actually it's some sort of like liberating thing but at the same time it's like bringing a community together like when they're at your shows I think, I think it is cool and it does like aesthetically look mint every time I see it it's like this looks okay, so cool thank uh, no thanks so much for saying that yeah that I guess that was like a big thing with zines and I, I know now there's more bands kind of making their own zines and mm-hmm. everything which is really cool but yeah definitely like a cool way of talking to maybe like people that would listen to your music about things um I don't know just in a different way than through lyrics like it's a little bit more to grab onto and start a conversation I guess so yeah kind of cool that's kind of our vibe with soft cult too is like this sounds so pretentious as hell and I'm so sorry but we (laughs) we we more than just like a band and we write songs and we like put those songs out we really have like a message behind our music that we're trying to have heard so yeah we're a very like natural step in doing that and like like you said hopefully starting conversations and encouraging you know people to start their own zines in their hometowns like if we visit some small town on tour and someone there is like sees the zine and they're like oh this is sick i'm gonna start doing that and then that way just kind of makes change in all these different towns that we tour with that's kind of like the dream (laughs) i think for us just building that personal connection, like you said, with the fans as well, on, on, on that sort of level where they feel like their voice can be heard as well as yours, but through your community and through your music as well. So I love it. That's pretty cool. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's pretty insane getting like submissions because mm-hmm. obviously, I don't know, like there's just so many cool ones. It's hard to pick like what to put yeah. and it just makes me so excited because yeah, the, there's people that are listening to our music that are so interesting and so artistic and cool yeah, creative yeah for it's, sure. it's just really really I don't know exciting <laughs> it's almost like I mean since we've never played a show as soft cult it's comparable to that sort of energy that you share at a live show in a way where like you get energy from the crowd and the crowd gets energy from you and you just keep recycling it yeah basically. yeah but we've had that I guess just through the arts and poetry submissions and from our zines so Hoping that when we go on tour one day, we'll be there. <laughs> I think this, in terms of like there being a message with the music, I don't. Think, I think there's nothing as powerful as like in music with yeah. some sort of purpose to it. When there's actually like some sort of context to it, I think it makes it more accessible in a sense. Definitely, no, definitely, and that's a really good point. That's something that I guess like we felt like we lost maybe with our previous band not that we d- never had a message but more just that it got like watered down yeah and so then with this project it's been so great just to like go like falls out kind of like just say whatever you want to yeah. say and I do think that like we, we are aware that what we have to say isn't for everyone and that it probably will piss off a lot of people it already has <laughs> but basically just the people that do connect to it are relating to something more than just, oh, I really like this song. They're relating to something deeper, like you said. Um, so uh, people who hear a little bit of themselves or see themselves represented in our music are going to bond with it even harder because it's speaking about something that is important to them or that they really relate to. And uh, it's, we all have like I'm sure all four of us have bands that we can think of where you felt like the song really related to you in a real way yeah. and it's like that's the dream I guess for any artist is to be someone's like soundtrack to their life and just like push them forward to do something so hopefully that hopefully yeah. we can be that for <laughs> yeah I think it's even if it's like the even two people like we had it where we was at um someone's like leaving party over the weekend and our band that we sort of not existed anymore they randomly put it on about why we're listening to this and oh it reminds us of when we first got together because it came out at the same time and we're like Whoa. oh <laughs> never thought of it like that it's crazy 
<laughs> that's so great yeah and you don't even yeah you probably never considered it but it was something so special to them in that moment yeah <laughs> that's so cool <laughs> then we're like we're over it it's fine just get rid of it turn it off <laughs> turn it off <laughs> yeah it's hard listening to your own music sometimes sometimes yeah. you're like please just turn it off <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's when you like my mum and dad play it, and I'm like, oh, oh. yeah, <laughs> oh, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our parents are the cutest and the best for that. Like whenever yeah. we put something out, they'll just play it on repeat as well, and it's like, it is so cute. But we straight up will will walk in and we'll just feel like our song is playing in one room and it's also playing in another room. <laughs> I don't know. The vibe is hard to explain. <laughs> <laughs> so with uh, Matt, today you you posted about uh, your hundredth posts, and in that you kind of discussed how it's been like five months of a band and like saying thank you to everyone who's started supporting you. In retrospect, how do you feel about the progress over five months? Because just from our perspective, it's a crazy amount of progress in five months. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I think yeah, like we just got really lucky with the team of people that we're working with right now they're really really I don't know they just they're just in it for the right reasons like they share I, I guess like our ethos with things so I think like they get it and they've just been able to really I don't know like it is a testament to what can happen when you work with people that actually get your project yeah. and actually like yeah. your project because like it, I think when things go well, it's like a team effort. Um, and yeah, like we were talking before, it is kind of validating to know that music that um, has something to say will resonate with people and just kind of react with people. So yeah, we don't know how it happened, but we it's definitely beyond our expectations of what we originally thought it was gonna be. Mm -hmm. So we're really happy about that. <laughs> love it i'm looking forward to hearing more anyway so Thanks. yeah this should we get into some horror <laughs> yes horror time, horror <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> all right then so we're going to our like recurring segments that we have so the first one is as you obviously obviously know is uh what's your favorite scary movie uh we may have like different ones mm -hmm. i guess fire them out let's go, go for it let's go <laughs> I, I, it was really hard for me to choose um because there's two that immediately come to mind for me uh but i think maybe my favorite of all time might be uh dario argento's 1977 suspiria nice yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. just for like the psychedelic colors and the cinematography and stuff and then the soundtrack by Goblin is so insane. And I love the concept of like, you know, this school for dancers that's actually run by witches. Yeah. Stuff. It's like a dope concept. <laughs> and I was quite a fan of the 2018 um, re remake. Yeah. With yeah. Is Chloe, Chloe Mortez who, who played. Uh, and that, yeah. A lot of really good actors. And then Tom York did the soundtrack for that. And he's like, <laughs> And um, yeah, so the, it, it was really hard to pick because I also love the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So that it was like- Nice, yeah. <laughs> those two, but I got to pick Suspiria. Oh, I, guess. Good. Oh, good. I think both, like you hadn't really seen any, any of like that stuff before, like Suspiria. I mean, watching it for the first time, I was like, where is this film going? And then when the, like, the <laughs> twist comes in and that, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> like, especially wow. like- the build up towards the end as well it's insane but that I, I don't think like you'd ever seen anything like that before probably around the 70s yeah no it was such a wild movie and yeah like you said just the end sequence goes so crazy like mm. it's kind of like a slow build and then the end is like what's happening <laughs> it's so insane and yeah i mean dario argento's films are all pretty sweet for that like i love the vibe or like the aesthetic of all of them but that one I feel like definitely he pushed it like to a whole other level yes yeah. Like, yeah you know ex it, that's like the most extreme one probably for uh, you know the cinematography aspect of it um yeah. yeah we're we were huge fans of it we were kind of obsessed with it and we would like 
put it on and then try and write music to it like nice yeah like, yeah it's been a big one for us for mm-hmm. a few years <laughs> There was a band that we had on called Blood Youth quite a while back, and they said when they were recording their album recently, uh, well, the last album that they released, they were saying that they just put on the worst horror films that they could probably find and then be inspired by that. So when they went in to record, they'd feel like slightly drained. I think oh. it's like it's such a like strange process. That would yeah, be- yeah, I'm sure just like all that imagery, just nonstop, you would be like, kind of like, what? <laughs> like- <laughs> yeah. Um, too like if you do a one like Suspiria where the the visuals are kind of artsy and they're really pretty like they're really beautiful then that puts you in one mindset but if you yeah. put something on I don't know that's like it's not like Texas Chainsaw yeah yeah, yeah. Something a little more like visceral or a little dark yeah. it would get you in like such a crazy mindset probably yeah uh, okay I think all right I- I think I thought of mine finally. <laughs> yeah, this whole time. Roll. <laughs> yeah, I just, oh, there's just so many I like, and then I'm like, oh, I'm like on the spot. No, but um, I think for me, and it's like a classic. Um, I'd say probably Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's Matt's favorite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I waited 53 episodes for someone to say Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> So no, I, I love it so much. Just the concept, the soundtrack, everything. Like, uh, and yeah, just as a as a uh, like a franchise too. There's been like a few like meh movies, but like it's it stood the test of time. I would say so. <laughs> yeah, the Dream Warriors one is sick. Yeah, I love the Dream Warriors. Yeah, number three. Yeah. So, like- so I tend to have this debate with you and the other mats. So yeah, there's three mats in total with us lot. So. <laughs> so in terms of nightmare franchise i always say it's the first new nightmare and then dream warriors but everyone tends to go one three and then new nightmare yeah i might be i might be one three and then new nightmare but that's fair enough <laughs> they're, they're all good like and that's just me you know that's just the ones that i tend to watch you just love the the dream warriors one for that scene where like the, the puppet is- yeah oh, oh man that's yeah Oh, that's insane. Yeah. You know, he snips it and he falls off. Oh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Oh, my God. Did you guys ever see, like, Freddy versus Jason? Did you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> what a film. What a nice, uh, feel-good film. Feel. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, it like, kind of, like, bordered on, like, horror comedy, didn't it? Like, oh, yeah. as much as it was a horror, like, it's crazy. I definitely feel like they made that for the fans. They're just like, yeah. Just yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, no, I used to put on the OG um, Nightmare. Uh, I used to put it on to fall asleep, which is like so dumb. <laughs> the one- <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> but it actually, yeah, I would do that. And it was like, I would get like crazy dreams too from it. So I don't know. Uh, I recommend <laughs> it if you're just bored with your regular like sleep schedule. <laughs> I so want to try that now. Did oh you see God. the remake out of interest? do it yeah no i had like a crazy dream where like my bed like turned into like i was lying in bed and then like i looked down and there were just like snakes all over my bed and i swear it, that sounds like it would be in like nightmare on Elm. yeah yeah i think that was from i it has to be from watching that <laughs> did you see the remake oh yeah what was yeah. your thoughts <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, the, the original is just like better, but I, I still, we're kind of like the wrong people to ask with that because we just like any horror movie that comes to theaters, we go and see it, even if we yeah. think it's gonna be bad. Yeah. We don't care. So, our birthday, like we're twins and we're born on Halloween. So I think nice. our, yeah. <laughs> our birthday, it's like always just loving creepy things and scary movies. But yeah, I mean, I will be honest, the remake, it's not, in my opinion, I don't like it as much as the original. To me, I see it kind of like pizza. It's like, there's bad pizza, but you see, it's not like that bad. Like, it's still like <laughs> it's still pizza. It's still, so it, it's like that with like remakes and stuff. I'm like, eh, it's not like the best pizza I've ever had, but it's like, all right. It's still a pizza. <laughs> I think, in my opinion, with the remake, it's more 
it's a time where CGI and stuff like that didn't complement it. Like the old practical stuff still worked better in that case. Yeah, that's a good point. People did get kind of heavy handed with like CGI that wasn't maybe like yeah the best looking. <laughs> Think about like you know like the Evil Dead yeah. remake though, which no, it's I really good. That. Yeah, it was and brilliant. That. that yeah, incredible. So they're trying, like, they did do some CGI and stuff, but I think they paid homage to the, like, sort of puppet-like aspect or the makeup aspect, yeah. like, all of that gore makeup and just stuff like that from the first one. They, um, yeah, they did a good job. Of yeah, it. they didn't reinvent the wheel no, yeah. with it. They just maybe changed the characters so it wasn't comparable to the original that much. But did you ever see you mentioned Freddy versus Jason? Did you know that there was meant to be a sequel which was Freddy Jason versus Ash? So what? there's a comic that there was a series <laughs> of comics that it was meant to be adapted from. So that's what ended up being the sequel was the comic version where it was Ash from the Evil Dead, Ooh. Freddy and Jason. That'd be intense. That odd, oh, but so it didn't end up. Did it, it didn't get green light, but it was the idea was that they were going to adapt the comic into what was going to be the sequel to Freddy vs. Jason. That would have been so sick. I wish that it would have happened, actually. Oh, I mean, it made. That's what I heard recently. It's crazy. Yeah, because I guess they, the show, like, I, there's two seasons of the show, right? Three. And then. Three. Yeah, so the third one's I don't know where if it's the same for Canada, but in the UK the third season's just come out in Netflix. Oh it's so not the same. <laughs> 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 yeah, see, get on it. So like go okay, so and then the movie, I guess it didn't get renewed and so then now they're making a movie instead or something like yes that. but it's not gonna have bruce campbell in it i don't know what they're gonna do with the fourth one it's gonna be something <laughs> to do with based in new zealand or somewhere <laughs> hmm. there's an economic on that i get I... like posted over to new zealand or something yeah like... yeah exactly oh my god <laughs> <laughs> we'll still watch it obviously like we'll we'll have to see when it comes out for sure <laughs> So, like, going back on, uh, like, you guys said you're born on Halloween. I, I know this is completely off topic, but I'm curious. Like, do you guys, like, in Canada, is it, is it celebrated as much Halloween now? Because over here, it's kind of, like, died down in the UK, and I, I'm yeah. pretty sad because, like, like, I fucking love Halloween. Like, I, I, I prefer that over Christmas. Like, but people don't tend to celebrate it much over here now. It's still – it's a big deal here still. Yeah. Um, you know what you mean? I've been to places where it's just not really that big of a deal. Um. Stuff like, at least on our street, like trick-or-treating maybe isn't so much of a thing anymore, which is kind of sad, but yeah. people decorating houses is still a thing. All the haunted houses you can go to, like that's our favorite thing to do. And we're so bummed that last year we couldn't because of COVID stuff, but yeah. we're going to like double up this year and go to like a million <laughs> houses. Uh, so it is, well, luckily it's still a big thing. Maybe it's more of like now an adult thing and less of a kid thing, I guess. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, I know what you mean. Like, dad down with trick or treat is here and everything. I, it was cool because it was a nice little like celebration for it. But you know, like you said, it's become more of like a adult thing of like, let's go out, get pissed, and then maybe go to a horror like attraction, which there's nothing wrong with that. Cause no, I'll, I'll wrong with that. Scary, <laughs> scary mazes. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, that's definitely the vibe here, too. It's kind of like, yeah, like bars will have like Halloween mm -hmm. special nights or whatever. But but we have to like get this next generation of kids back into Halloween. Tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a haunted house in Toronto that is like our favorite one ever because it's actually in a there's not that many castles in Canada. I know in the UK you have like a ton of castles and cool stuff. Like yeah, that. oh, the, the fucking everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> a castle here is rare. So there's a castle in Toronto, and they do like a haunted house inside where you can go through like every level of the castle. Nice. And they put some budget behind it. Like there's people hanging from the ceiling that come oh. down. It's 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 crazy. So that's so cool. It's so sad. 
See, that's what we need because like the ones over here, they don't really go all out for it. So the the, the, the best I've been to, I went to Horror Nights in Orlando back in like 2019, and that was like wow. Compared to the stuff we have over here, like they do put some like effort into that, but. It doesn't. It's not as scary as you want it to be, but then again, it's like how far do you want them to push it before it, before <laughs> it gets like overboard? Yeah, even those ones that are like you know at the pumpkin patch or whatever, those like yeah. gorgeous haunted houses, they're still fun. Yeah, I still yeah. kind of like those, even though they're not the scariest. Yeah, Get, you getting can... chased by chainsaw guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small field. Uh, yeah, yeah. The maze. always. <laughs> you, you guys probably have like maybe heard of this like those crazy like extreme haunted houses that like people... mckamey manor yeah yeah. Like, yeah that's what the fuck like why would you want to put yourself through that like you sign a waiver like that says you could possibly die from this it's like well why are you doing it <laughs> <laughs> guy like torture you like, i don't know if he's still if this is still true but we watched a little documentary on mckamey manor and back when the documentary was made he does it all for free so that's how you know he's like there's something he tapped. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There's apparently a big waiting list, isn't there, for it as well? Like people What the yeah. fuck? Yeah, <laughs> there is. Yeah, there's a huge waiting list. And like you said, the waiver and everything, and you have to be like if something happens to you there, like yeah, they're just <laughs> like it doesn't yeah. my fault. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> So in this documentary we watched, his wife is so like when they interview her, you can tell she just doesn't want to be there, and she's like, "Yeah, um, I don't, I don't really remember when he started doing this." Um, and she's just like <laughs> not down. She's like, this "Yeah, this is like now, you know, it's just yeah." Yeah, they can like pull your teeth out and like cut your own like, but what? I don't know. Yeah, they, 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 that says all this. Like you might have broken bones from it. They try and like they, they like duck you underwater for like for ages. They stuff food in your mouth like anything like yeah. I it's insane. Feed you and like lock you in their coffin and you. Oh my like, god. In there, just, yeah. Do you guys think would you ever do anything like that, or is that that's like the cutoff? That's like I think that's no. a, that's like <laughs> next level. Like fair enough. Like. I, I wouldn't I'd like one where it's like kind of a crazy experience but not to the point where I'm signing the waiver for my death you know what I mean like <laughs> if I'm gonna die um but yeah because a lot of places they can't like physically touch you can the evil light or anything like that so um but obviously there's a lot of reasons for that but yeah I know what you mean yeah I, I wouldn't bother doing that though definitely not I'm not like crazy I'd uh no, I don't do it either like i kind of yeah. like having the the like golden rule is like don't touch them they won't yeah. touch you yeah, i like oh, that yeah. <laughs> yeah no touching no touchy <laughs> <laughs> there's a great horror movie as well actually based on a uh, based on an actual haunted attraction and uh it's an actual haunted attraction in, in in real life but they changed the name of it for the purpose of this movie and it's like um this sa- satanic cult that used to be in this house and he, and he like um he killed people in there and basically these people go in there to create their own haunted attraction and as they're doing it they're realizing this house is like really like haunted and there's you know what i mean because it's like full of different demons and shit goes down in it while they're setting it up for the haunted attraction and then when they open it up even more shit goes down it's on amazon it's on amazon actually i have to think of the name but Hell house? Hell house? yeah, that's... yeah. Wait, wait what what do you say then sorry Hell House. Hell House, yeah. Hell House LLC, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I watched that like last. Yeah, week. it's sick. Uh, it's really good. Oh my god. Yeah, that's. There's a few that are sick like that. Like I guess on Shutter Haunt. Oh is- yeah, there's Lord Haunt's a really good one. Yeah. Or the houses October built is pretty good if you're like scared of clowns and like clown yeah. houses. That one. But yeah, that Hell House LLC, I liked the like found footage style. Yeah, and just sick. that concept of yeah, like the cult stuff was like so cool, creepy and it's cool. So yeah. Sick. Oh my it's god. Few and far between. We we found footage movies like that that I like, but like I was quite surprised with that one. Like the other map put me onto that, and yeah, I was I was quite like happy with it. Like considering like because most found footage movies these these days recycle the same thing over and over, but that like was quite freaky especially the bit with the uh the clown when he sat down on the floor and the next minute his head is turned and yeah. he's like chasing him around the house well he just keeps appearing at different points around the house it's like what i know that yeah. part was the part where because it's kind of like yeah it keeps happening but like it escalates so much and yeah that part was when i was like what is happening <laughs> it really freaked me out oh 
watch. You're, so normally found footage your jam? You're not normally a fan? No, well, some of them I am, but I feel like a, a lot of them just recycle the same thing, like, over and over. I mean, films like Wreck, for example, they did a really good job with it. Like, they reinvented it after, like, the Blue Witch Project, but then, I don't know, you get quite a lot of them that are just very samey, and it's a bit, yeah, a bit meh. Because I know, like, I'm, like, I not many people are, but I'm a fan of Blair Witch Project, like, the original one. Yeah. It's like, that another one was a contender for like the ones I was maybe going to mention for the favorite yeah. but I know so many people like <clears throat> will see it now and they'll be like oh it's like nothing even happened it's not scary and all that stuff but it's, it's not about that it's about like the suspense of something yeah. happening yeah exactly <laughs> you said it I like <laughs> see the witch at the end like i like that you, your imagination's probably worse than whatever they can make you know in the well movie. i was thinking it like oh shit what film is it uh one with mel gibson in it science is it oh, Where oh yeah it kind of ruins the film will reveal what the thing looks like yeah mm-hmm. yeah that i feel like yeah that can happen in movies up to it and then it's like maybe just like for that time the budget or like the technical or whatever there so yeah if it's i don't know to me i I always kind of like when it's like you don't fully see like a creature or like a you know something like that and (laughs) and you guys probably know this vibe too because you're into scary movies but do you ever feel like you love the movie except for the ending like it's a good movie yeah that that does happen a lot yeah 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 yeah, with horror movies especially, I find we're like, the movie's great, the ending kind of sucked, but everything before <laughs> yeah. that was good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, because you don't know how to wrap it up, it's like the, it's like the same concept of, um, like, if you write a song, you have like a really good chorus, but then you don't know what else to kind of do with it, or like combine with it to make it be like, consistent. Yeah. It's so hard when, like, we used to always have this thing with choruses specifically where, like, we love the verse, we love everything we've got, and then the chorus has to be, I guess, like, the shining moment of the song because it keeps coming back. And then you you get kind of, like, you choke when it comes to writing the chorus. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. You mentioned Shudder. Have you uh, seen Skirmy on Shudder? Scary? Skirmy. Oh, Skirmy. Uh, no, no. We're so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what it is is uh, we had the director and the guy who accident Josh Rubin on the podcast last year. Um, but it's essentially it's like it's not exactly scary. It's just stupidly creative. And I would do it. It's basically about two people stuck in a uh, log cabin in a power cut, and they're both writers. One's really acclaimed, and one's wanting to be a acclaimed writer, and is kind of envious on this. Um, woman writer who is um, obviously successful from that so then what they start doing is telling each other these scary stories and building up on it but as they're doing it there's like fake it's like crazy sound design and stuff like that which kind of like enhances it like there's one about a werewolf and then like in the shadow there's like a claw coming out like acting the stories out and they yeah tell them and she's like acted out to me i want to like I want to like feel like I'm in the story sort of thing, and yeah, like like you said, the sound design just is brilliant behind it. It, it completely makes the film. But yeah, you, I think you guys will love it actually. That's sick. Yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. definitely have to check that out. Yeah. I'm. I, we are like we love that new wave of horror. I don't even know. I guess like slow burn I don't, is how you would describe it, but like yeah, yeah. Hereditary yeah. or like The Witch or The House. Or like, yeah, we. Horror, you know all those yeah. new things. Whatever. Midsummer as well was a really good one. That's like it's very artsy, but it's very out there. Uh, I don't know if you guys caught that one, Midsummer. Yeah, I yeah. Love, love it. Anything Ari Aster does, I mean, I guess he's only had like two horror movies out, but yeah, seems yeah. like it's. I love that it's sort of like a new genre in horror almost, and he always gets amazing actors and amazing like composers for the soundtrack and everything. It's like. For, for people who would like maybe dismiss movies as a genre that's just kind of not up to par with, you know with with other genres like drama yeah, and stuff like that. yeah. it's kind of like taking horror maybe to a whole other level mm-hmm. of cinematography or just like cinema in general i love it 
<laughs> I think the bit with Midsummer is um, obviously there's loads of disturbing shit in that film, but one of the one of the most disturbing is like right at the beginning, yeah. where it's the car alarm blends into the score that they've got when they're going up the stairs to see her parents and stuff like that. That is so uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah. yeah there's lots of cool like freaking moments oh like that one like scream where after the scene like, yeah yeah the scene <laughs> the scene <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> oh, that just like lives rent free in my mind but, like I, I can't unhear it now <laughs> I, think, I think the score is so great just from a music perspective because lies um just in midsummer it's a lot of like human voices and stuff mm. but they'll be, like try tones and it'll start like some like sounding and then just kind of devolve into like nightmare version of the song <laughs> yeah in theaters when there's like good speakers and stuff I, my skin yeah. is like falling every time <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the, it's the same with like Hereditary and Midsummer, but then also like Get Out and Us. Like they're so good scores for them. Yeah, Definitely, yeah. Get Out with it. So many easy, yeah, concepts. I guess they're not just like making a remake of like a classic or something. It's like a brand new kind of like concept. So whenever okay. like movie scores especially in horror come up want to know like have you guys seen it follows yeah Yeah. we was talking about that on the last podcast we we did as well that that film got brought up yeah and like disaster pieces soundtrack for that is so sick (laughs) that's what makes it like sound in a horror movie including the soundtrack is is like the one of the biggest like elements probably more than the actual like movie itself because if you take all that away there's you know what i mean it's nowhere near a scary but if you get rid of the soundtrack and left left in the dialogue it's not the same feel although there was like this and i'm blanking on it now but it was a japanese horror movie but i just can't remember the name where there was no like music to it yeah you'd think it would be like not as scary because sometimes the soundtrack totally does make it with yeah. this it really was like I felt so on edge the whole time because there were no cues of like, oh, something's about to happen. Right, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. that's testament to like the actors though, in it and the physicality and yeah. the way they like play that character, right? So yeah. For sure. Yeah. I guess maybe it makes it a bit more of a... yo, what? <laughs> like but I just assumed that something bad was going to happen every second that I was watching it. <laughs> 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 right so we'll get on to uh our second segment uh, which is pet peeves so what pisses you off the most what doesn't piss me off <laughs> 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 uh, on a very real level i think something bean and i get pissed off a lot at in the music scene is like elitism you know gatekeeping yeah attitudes yeah like it's always uh, the stereotype that like we can probably all recognize is like this neckbeard dude on the internet that's like no that's not <laughs> that's not good or like that's not good. <laughs> and he'll you know I, I feel like it is the one detriment of like the alternative scene that we all love to say that we're so accepting and we're so like we like being alternative we like having this fucked up little family and stuff like we're not on the mainstream and that is what makes alternative sick but then when an artist in the alternative scene tries to kind of break out of a certain sound or do something different it they can be like pretty harshly judged by like the elitists or like the gatekeepers in that scene and i know it's been a thing since like the punk you know days in like the 80s even or like the hardcore days where there's just so many labels of things. labels that don't yeah. matter i guess it's and it, it can be really cringy having a conversation with someone that like they just refuse to listen outside of their like their little know, bubble yeah yeah i think that's like 
one of our biggest pet peeves in music right now even just being like you know two women in a band it's been yeah you know, talking about like a guitar tone or talking about like a certain way of playing or a style or something. They're just kind of like looking lesser on you because the, you don't fit the like image of, yeah, what they anticipate a band like you to be or whatever. So yeah, that's my pet peeve. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a sort of experience with that because we, we used to be in uh what was a female fronted band i hate the term female fronted band but it was a female fronted band and i remember there was God, this is years ago and since then the kind of the situation has changed but it was like in terms of like festival lineups kind of like blacking out every male fronted band and just showing the female fronted bands mm-hmm. and i remember sharing that on socials and i remember a guy going well girl fronted bands don't release better good like good enough music then he took the game and it fairly enough he got absolutely slaughtered for it but it's just that (laughs) stigma of like why that matters yeah and it's it's so like subjective too that's what i I don't get like someone will say if something's good or bad based on their own personal tastes and even like you know i i notice a lot of old heads with this scene will sometimes you know, compare something coming out now to something that's been done before. But like, as if like music doesn't draw influence from like stuff that came before, like everything, like art in general is always drawing influence from, you know, what came before. And just because it's been done before doesn't mean that it was done like best, Yeah. you know? Like whoever did it first doesn't mean they did it best. The music evolves, so. Yeah, it's hard to have conversations with people like that when they're just so set on like, nope, I don't need to listen to anything different than what I listened to when I was seven. <laughs> and yeah. I'm just going to. <laughs> yeah, yeah fucking people like that. <laughs> this is why Spotify really is a good thing in a way. Ears. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like I, I, the, the good thing about Spotify, even though like it does shit on artists a lot, is you can discover a lot more new music through that like for me like getting introduced with new bands through like daily mixes and stuff like stuff i wouldn't usually go out my way to try and find and it pops up i'm like that's fucking sick and then you know i mean they you you discovered a new band so yeah i I love that sort of like aspect of what like that sort of freedom that we have nowadays where you can do that obviously going to a record shop and picking up a record that was the norm like back in the day and some people still do that which is cool but yeah the fact that we have that sort of freedom online as well that's pretty cool that's such a good point. Yeah, I really, like, I do think that was a big thing with Spotify that, like, switched up the industry was, like, instead of the people, I guess, that were, like, radio, like, I don't know, more in, more in charge of radio, kind of, like, gatekeeping certain songs or bands or whatever, now it's can curate your own. Yeah. So these bands that maybe you would never have heard of otherwise. And, yeah, definitely, like, the algorithm of Spotify, like helps with that like for sure as sometimes it's annoying but yeah it, it'll definitely like show you like bands you probably wouldn't have heard of otherwise so and even if you are in so, sort of like a niche market I guess then you'll do well in that market and you'll find your fans and they'll find find your following that way um whereas you were saying when you're putting your trust in the hands of like the disc jockeys or the label heads or something like that and they're kind of telling you what to listen to it's a it's a different vibe it's just more political that yeah. way like yeah though as for all spotify's faults does make it um somewhat of an even playing field for emerging artists because you can you can find like your following a lot easier that way and and just people from like total the opposite side of the world will find you and yeah. you might have like a huge going in korea for all you know <laughs> so 
Phoenix, what was your pet peeve? My oh, pet sorry. peeve. <laughs> Dang. Um, okay, my pet peeve. I think it's um probably the same thing, honestly. Like people, th- this might sound like a little. You did say to find the pettiest pet peeve, like the pet. Do it. That coin. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, <laughs> just like an like I'm totally the type of vegetarian that I don't care about what other people like how other people eat is like none of my business but I feel like maybe just growing up in a family that has like German roots like like it was so people when they found out that I was vegetarian would just try to convert me so hard like with everything they could possibly do and that's the only thing I'm like I don't know with with that stuff i'm like just don't with it, it, it can apply to anything just don't try to convince someone to something if they're totally happy the way that they are living their peaceful existence yeah. it doesn't Why, affect you. you don't need to feel like you're, you're that like your way of life's better and you need to like take it upon yourself to convert them you know <laughs> Um, there is almost like we grew up like as teenagers and you guys I, I feel like we're probably around the same age so you guys probably can relate to this too there was like the weirdest like fetish like people were just like <laughs> oh bacon put it on everything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so as it's as teenagers being vegetarian and stuff people would just be like oh here's my big map does this gross you out <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's McDonald's that just slapping bacon and everything, everything like they uh, that they bring out. Yeah. <laughs> you know what this standard meal needs? Bacon. <laughs> that too, like no judgment. But yeah, it just it's it's like from every corner, people are like, I don't know, judging you for that, I guess. And like, where do you get your nutrition from? Oh yeah, where do you get your <laughs> like oh <laughs> I think for credit to vegans and vegetarians were me and myself, I still eat meat, but most of it is vegetarian that we eat throughout the week. Yeah. But like for people to be like full on vegetarian, fair play to you, I couldn't do it, but it's not something to be mocked. No, well, and it's like everyone can do it differently. Like if you like, if you like meat, you just don't want to eat it all the time you totally can just be like all right during the week i'm veggie and then during the weekend i'm gonna whatever like have fun like eat whatever i want kind of thing like there's no one way like everyone should just do what works for them it's kind of like music that way like just do what yeah. works for you and don't let other people tell you what to do i guess because there is that other side of it too where i know i've definitely as a teenager i met a lot of like very pretty vegans that yeah. i could see that totally turning you off even wanting to try it just because you associate it with like this annoying <laughs> type thing yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's but yeah I, it's pretty astounding how even the stats of like if you just cut down or if everyone in the world was vegan for like one day like the effect it would have on the environment and stuff so that's what I always tell my friends that are like thinking about trying it but they don't know if they can commit to it it's like you don't have to commit to it. Just try it. Even if it starts with like one day a week, you try, right? You're already impacting the environment and stuff just by doing that. So there shouldn't be like a tier yeah. system of like, I am a <laughs> level 10 <laughs> vegan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think people forget that you actually, with like vegetarian food, you can actually make nice shit with it like i don't i think everyone thinks like oh it's just plain you don't have anything else with broccoli and then that's it and it's like no you can do so much with it yeah it's true yeah it's like yeah that's so true like people think that it won't be good but if you think about it it's just removing like one ingredient from what you're eating for the most part or replacing it or replacing it yeah like (laughs) having a different protein type thing in there but yeah for the record there definitely can be like gatekeeper-y like vegetarian <laughs> gatekeeper yeah. veggies yeah they're like it's just, the same thing we're talking about yeah like, basically yeah. No more. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah it's also sick seeing now um because it's definitely changed since we were kids um but just the different and in north america we're very far behind where you guys are at um in terms of just vegan options for things being readily accessible like that's not a thing that's 
happening now with stuff like that finally coming in but I we did notice like being in Europe and being in the UK it's just so much easier in just like around where you don't have to go out of your way to like this vegan restaurant across town type thing yeah <laughs> so it, it's it's cool to see that happening now there's definitely a lot more options where when like yeah we were kids you know mm-hmm. It's all about corn chicken nuggets. The, they're the ones. <laughs> so I, yeah. <laughs> so like I, tr- I tried them for the first time. Like, like I, I'm not really much of a like, vegetarian myself, but like I did try that. And even like over here, we've got like a bakery called Greg's. Don't know if you've ever been to Greg's or you're over here. They brought in the vegan sausage roll not long back. And I actually think that tastes better than the normal sausage roll. Don't it? Which to me, like I was like, I don't think it's got to taste better, but I'll give it a go. And I was actually quite surprised when I came. So it was like, you know, fair enough. Like... <laughs> Nice. You tried it. That's the thing. You were you you weren't sure, but you tried it, and you were happily surprised. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, is that the thing that it like blew up online? That like was it like Pierce Morgan or like someone like that was like I don't know having a field day with the like vegan sausage roll or something. Probably Pierce Morgan. It usually is. Yeah, he's like <laughs> probably he's, he's usually representing our country in the uh, in the wrong way. But yeah. I'd love to smack him with a sausage roll. That'd be great. Just like, <laughs> don't worry. There's definitely like Canadians that will definitely do the same. Like, yeah. So yeah. it's not just it's not just Pierce Morgan. Ugh. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a loud mouth in every country. Definitely yes. loud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's my extra pet peeve, Pierce Morgan. You can fuck off. <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, it seems like, I, I don't know, he kind of fell from grace a little after those c- comments he made. Yeah. Like, oh, he fell from grace way before then. He just unfortunately kind of raveled his way into society once again. And then everyone realized what a turd he was after he said them comments. Yeah, <laughs> true. It's it's It blew up over here, too. Like, it's crazy. What we all, I mean, I guess after the Oprah interview and stuff, that just blew yeah. up. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. The Pierce Moore we were definitely having dinner and like ah oh, like talking <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean I it's that's another thing I guess that is sort of a pet peeve of mine is like there's I guess a lot of debates right now about um cancel culture and stuff like that and I feel like there's like on on one side and another side there's like two extremes and then somewhere in the middle is probably the you know the truth or whatever but when like, like someone gets held accountable and then it just gets written off as like oh these kids and their cancel culture and stuff yeah. like that, you know? <laughs> it's like uh kevin spacey making a comeback in films oh what how yeah how like, is that even happening as well what <laughs> <sighs> well to me yeah like that and then just the fact that like Chris Brown still has a career after mm-hmm. like so much Isn't it? Stuff. <laughs> stuff. I know, and it's like common knowledge, and yet he's so I think getting nominated for like Grammys and like yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah I don't know. We had a mini success when Donald Trump got voted out of office anyway, without going into politics, but yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Can breathe a sigh of relief? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have the nuclear codes anymore. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> pretty insane video actually of him like I guess he's just been staying in a hotel like just living in a hotel in Florida and there there's like this video of him kind of in a back patio of the hotel on like a little mini stage still ranting about how like oh the election results were rigged and all this stuff and well in his typical you know Trump way. yeah yeah and there's maybe like 20 people in the audience or something and every now and then there's like a whoop and like a clap <laughs> it's great like this was the leader of the world and now he's just like ranting to randoms in like a hotel you know he's like a crazy old man just like stood yeah. on the street just speaking his gospel like <laughs> it's just yeah, pretty much uh, you know what annoys me more american politics or our politics <laughs> You guys have like Boris Johnson current like not been fun recently. It's it's messed no. up Canadian too. Like uh, oftentimes like traveling 
like I don't know people I, uh, I don't know this like we're so close to the states like just geographically and then also like we do have our fair our fair share of like lame politicians but yeah just I don't know sometimes it's scary because you're just like lumped in <laughs> with I yeah. Don't know. yeah craziness sometimes that's another pet peeve is if we go to like a their country and people assume we're American and we have to be like, no, 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 we're not American. We're American. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against you, American. Not that but it matters. In, but... in the Trump era, I did not want to be, you know, mistaken. mistaken. <laughs> yeah, I find it crazy, like, without getting all, like, deep into this, like, are you guys so close to the USA, but yet you, 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 like, Canada has got much more of a hold of, like, gun control laws and stuff like that? compared to the USA and like the statistics and that I just, the difference is crazy. Just considering you're literally like just, it's just one step over the road kind of thing in it. You know what I mean? You're like you're next to each other. It is pretty yeah. wild. It, even within the States, like touring there is, is like really awesome and amazing, but it's just crazy. Like the certain, like what'll be legal in one state and then just the next state over is like so illegal. And like yeah. at just going over state lines, like on tour, you have to really be calm conscious of that stuff and yeah you know it, it make us sort of <laughs> proud to be from a more like I guess progressive country in terms of gun laws and even like you know gay marriage for example it's been legal in Canada for over 10 years and it just became legal under Obama I guess in the states so just stuff like that where it's like it's a celebration for everyone when when something happens for that country like any country starts to become more progressive yeah. but you're right. It is crazy how like these these borders that divide us and it, it can be so different, even though we're literally neighbors like right next door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's all about knocking those uh, those walls down anyway, instead of putting them up like Trump wanted to. But yeah, with a vegan yeah. sausage roll. <laughs> yeah, it's a vegan sausage roll. We'll do it. it. Vegan sausage roll for president. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, I heard a good quote about that where it was like, you know, the next fascist in office isn't going to be as obvious. They're going to be more eloquent and they're going to be, you know, even more charismatic and stuff like that. And, and it's a never ending struggle, like just because one battle for good, I guess, is one, then that yeah. doesn't, that's it. Like you have to stay vigilant and you have to yeah. make sure with your voting power that you're not electing someone that could you know, fuck things up for a lot of people. So it, uh, it's funny because I, I think up until the Trump administration, our generation was sort of like romanticizing the idea of, you know, the past where, you know, in my mom's generation, it was like the Korean War and protesting that and, and you know, women's liberation and stuff. And I remember as a young 20 year old thinking like, oh, I don't have anything like that. I don't have any <laughs> cause to get behind. And then the world just in 2016, tw yeah, 2016, like kind of went to shit and just yeah. steadily just kept getting worse and worse. It's like, be careful what you wish for, I guess. You know? <laughs> and then we hit 2020. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was like the finale of a shit four year run. <laughs> Yeah, it did have big season finale vibes. Did it? All bets are off. Oh, We've got yeah. COVID. <laughs> We've got Black Lives Matter. Oh, we're supposed to be like murder hornets. I don't know what happens to yeah. that. But, yeah. <laughs> There's no. apparently a new variant of bird flu coming out this year. Oh, so no. we've like... Yeah, we've got forward to... <laughs> I, I do think, though, like... I mean, obviously, I would rather the world be a much better place than it is, but absolutely, as a lot of really good music has come out of it, um, and it's it's cool to see music. Like I know everything is so cyclical, but it's cool to see artists kind of taking more of a political stance on things and being writing music that is sort of representative of the times. Hundred um, percent. So I am really excited. Idols represent yeah. these All these the these guys as well. Yeah. yeah. Idols. <laughs> Hell yeah! It's nice to to not uh, to not be listening to fluff, I guess, and not be writing yeah. fluff. Like to feel like there's real substance behind it. 
Rage Against the Machine even came back. I mean, you know, that's how you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rage and System of a Down. When they start releasing shit, it's it's happened. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> <laughs> It does make me, again, just back to the whole shows thing, uh, excited for that to come back because I feel like we all now have this renewed sense of global community just because of all the social and political stuff we've just been watching the past year and a half. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, writing, like artists, like being stuck inside and writing about it and then kind of radicalizing their fan base to an extent, like... I I don't know for sure, but I, I think it, it will almost be like a new awakening of punk and grunge and just like, you know, writing political music. I'm excited to see what happens. 100%. So, yeah, yeah before we end up going deeper into politics, um, my, my camera's frozen, so I don't know if you guys can hear me. Hear <laughs> my... Are you here? Oh, one sec. It's, it's, one sec. Oh, Come broadband, back. broadband. Hey, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, thank thank you guys for coming on. Like, I've loved this chat. Like, covered all sorts of different topics. And yeah, it's been great. So thank you for coming on. Thanks yeah. for having us, for real. Definitely, yeah, it was really good to talk to you guys. Yeah. Cool. We'll do a fake goodbye and then <laughs> we'll wrap up properly. But yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. Anytime, for real. Uh, as soon as we heard uh, there was a podcast that was into uh, horror movies and stuff, we were like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Thanks so much. Bye. So that was episode 53 of an Evil Podcast. A big thanks to Mercedes and Phoenix for coming on. Uh, really enjoy that conversation. Like The fact we got so like deep into horror movies, like you can't go wrong with that. So, uh. <laughs> fine. I finally, finally got someone who said a nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a little win for Lund. Yeah. Again, massive thank you for Mercedes Vince for coming on the podcast. If you like, I said, and if you've not checked it, you're the right already. Go and check it out. It is such a good EP. Uh, otherwise than that, if you haven't had a look at all over 52 episodes that we do go and check them out but we also have other episodes and different series as well so if you haven't already checked out the hardcore project with our good old pal alex smith make sure to go and check out the new episode of that it is such a good chat we've also got silver screen on scene with ryan make sure to go and listen to that as well because who doesn't look an in-depth talk about film we all enjoy a good talk about film once and again. But otherwise than that, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching. What, I said, what, otherwise than that. Fuck. Yeah, thank you, you love that word. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise than that, thank you. Otherwise than that, yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>